um, I wanted to bring a little bit of uh, Wales into uh, my uh, medieval classes um, today, um, especially Huldar um, and his laws, um, because I think they're very significant um, to our heritage and to our identity um, in Wales. So um, I thought we'll try it, especially with uh, Carl wanting to uh, look at um, Wales and Britain a little bit more. I thought it might be a, a good thing to look at. Um, and when I was looking at this, um, I, I realised I had two books that were quite significant in terms of this. So um, Land of My Fathers by Gwynfor Evans. Um, he talks about um, Hjuldar quite, um, quite often and he talks about these laws as well. So um, there's a full book of uh, Welsh history as well, 2000 years. So uh, that was a very interesting book and he pulls in archaeology and history and different disciplines. So I, I liked that one um, and it was very good to look at his interpretations. Um, and then another book that I got quite recently, um, Medieval Wales, um, 1050 um, to uh, 1332, um, Centuries of Ambiguity um, by Steve, uh, David Stevenson. Um, he talks a little bit about it, but um, in the later medieval period, because this is a bunch of laws that have shaped Wales for many years and um, we haven't really had um, any of our own laws in Wales for 500 years um, as well. So that was another significant thing as well in Wales's history that I wanted to bring in towards the end. But the, the significance of this book as well is that the uh, image is one of the images from the uh, Welsh version of the manuscript. So uh, I thought that was uh, quite interesting. And uh, just but as soon as I saw the image in the manuscript, I was like, oh, I know where that is. And I went straight to the book. Um, <laughs> So this is it is definitely um, an interesting topic, and um, and I think it, it also shows why he's called Huldar. It means how are the good, and um, it's the reason why he has that name. It's it's very significant because of these laws, um, and these laws that are discussed today are um, significant because of how modern some uh, historians seem to think they are. Um, how they're presented um, in the English version and the Welsh version, and how that's inspired um, a lot more um, uh, interest nowadays. Um, and you get to see these laws clash with many other laws from different uh, civilizations, different people, which is quite interesting um, to, to look at. Um, but also, I think it's, it's very significant because this is a justice, a justice system that's beginning in medieval Wales. And um, you start to see these uh, checks and balances a little bit. Um, but ultimately, these laws were made to ensure that these um, officers of the king um, was able to assess each case um, without getting him involved because um, if you've got a lot of complaints, loads of people complaining and if you are a king, you are ruling a lot of people, you can have complaint after complaint after complaint day in, day out and um, it was seen to be more practical to have uh, laws um, for this sort of thing. So it does discuss a lot of civil issues um, theft and crime and laws on women which uh, were very um, modern as well for what you'd think it would be for that time period and I think that they're very progressive as well for, for the period because you, you you see more than oh, I think I see a chat and is it right and it's okay for your lateness um We've only just started anyway, and I'll be, I'm recording so you can watch this over. Um, but the, the, these kings later on after um, Huol Tsar, um, for example, um, King of Gwynedd, uh, Blanard Ap uh, um and that was in the mid 11th century. He he took this on and a lot more kings. And you definitely see that in um, the land of my father's book, how this gets taken. And the manuscripts that we look at now aren't um, from the time that they were created. They are later, but they're still medieval. And it, it's just very interesting to see how, um, because there is an English and Welsh version, how different they are as well. Um, and we'll get into that. but. 
I just think that they're very important for our identity and a lot of scholars have pointed towards that and um, it's only started to uh, get more attention I think in, in popular culture now really and more people starting to know about it which I think is great and especially for people in Wales to know about their past and um, know about their history. Oh, my mouse wants to work. Here you go. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of uh, an overview from what I had read about him. This is him in the manuscript as well. Um, so the, the, he is heavily associated with this and he seems to be in a very uh, uh, powerful position. Um, and you, you've got almost like a, a nicer sort of kind of softer face for me. He doesn't look very stern. So uh, I think that points towards uh, how they viewed him as well. Um, and the fact that this is a little manuscript and they're still referencing him, it, it shows his popularity, I think, how he's got this reputation from these laws and so many other things, but these laws are very significant. Um, that's what we're looking at today. So just arguing why these laws are significant. Um, and he was known for these generous laws. And the reason why I say they're generous is because people seem to think that they were fair. Um, he was just thinking of the minds of the people. He didn't want many disputes. He just, it was almost like he just wanted the case dealt with quickly. And so any cases that weren't talked about, he could deal with them himself. And um, from looking into him as well, um, it said that he's the only Welsh ruler to issue his own coins um, as well. So but that would, that'd be quite interesting to see the debate on that but I, I from these are just over general facts of them um and he, he he created codified laws as well so these are the codified laws and these codified laws gave people reassurance that they were protected from injustices it also helped people feel like um justice was served and I think it was also a deterrent from doing anything that might harm people or, or annoy people um, and it, it, it said that, it, so it was from the early 900s um, that this was all going about, and he, I've been trying to find when he sort of um, came into the world, but um, no definitive answer, but I did find that in 1928, um, uh, no, in 928, sorry, <laughs> he, he went to a pilgrimage in Rome, he didn't um, resurrect and then go on a pilgrimage, <laughs> um, I apologise, it's been a long day, I had um a manuscript study for about four hours it was only meant to be two today and it, it oh. scrambled my brain um but it, it definitely uh, put me back into the manuscript mood for today <laughs> um and it said that he's died in about 949 um or 950 as well um so that, again not definitive um and he was considered to be the king of all wales it's, it's, he you know king of the people as well he really i think this is appropriate as well just showing how he was um, and i just think the fact that these laws were carrying on these people really favored it it really worked well and i, I think it just sort of puts wales in a, a, a nicer picture of it all as well and um, it just shows us um more of the thinking of back then and how much more progressive we were than what what was made out i think as well and um he, I think he he was remembered mostly for these laws um, and I've definitely because of these manuscripts, like I've said, they, they really want to show you that this was his creation. And I think they, they're almost inspired by him as well, because later rulers have um, added their own little bits to the laws and uh, just changed it a little bit. But ultimately, they agree with what he's saying because they've seen how happy it made the people. And it definitely became something of um, a, a badge of national, uh, national pride, really, in a way, when um, it came to uh, the Edwardian conquests and the Norman conquests. It's something that Wales is very proud of. And I think it's something that we should still be very proud of. I think it would be nice to see this sort of uh, manuscript um, in person. I think that's one of my little dreams now is to go and actually see it in person rather than seeing digitised um, manuscripts, which I know is the future. And I think having things online, you can better preserve it. Um, but I think mm. nothing beats seeing something in person um, and just actually seeing what it's like. Um, but he, he, he's creating this legal, legal code um, and is written in a way that is understandable by everyone, everyone understands it. And if they don't, there's images on the side to help them understand what it means, but that's only in the Welsh version as well. Um, but it, it, 
in my eyes, I think he, he's a very significant uh, person in Welsh history and is all thanks to these laws. Um, these laws, I think, in some parts of it, you do read some parts that are think, and you think that's a little bit funny. Um, but I think you get that with a lot of uh, history's old laws as well. Um, for example, I think there's one um, in England where if you you can be arrested for holding um, a fish suspiciously. I, I don't really know what, what that is, but um, you know, little things like that, and it just makes you think what, or makes you giggle. So uh, you do come across with some of these in here, um, but I wanted to just look at the serious part of it and what that can reveal as well. Um, so, uh, these are considered to be uh, laws of the court, so the cases don't have to be presented to the king all the time. And um, that's when things are really bad, I think, when he gets pulled into it. Um, and you definitely see throughout the manuscript there's um, images of um, officers like judges um, getting involved and sort of listening to, fit it to the people and sort of giving their own judgment to it. So I think that's a very, uh, very important thing to note. Um, and they were just these laws are just laying down the responsibilities and the obligations and, and even entitlements of the people um, and the king um, and those of the court as well. And in this manuscript, they put um, a, a heavy importance on lawyers and their tongues because their tongues are important for this because they're the instrument that helps um, bring justice in society. So it was very um, important to read. And um, I was today the images that I'm showing you are mostly the Welsh uh, manuscript, only because the English one just doesn't have the illuminations, and I just like the illuminations. That's something I love about manuscripts: is illuminations and just looking at them and seeing what they can tell. Um, there's no um, sort of in-your-face colours, there's no um, gold leaf or no um, dark blue colours, the expensive colours really, it seems to be uh, just the same sort of colours, the, the reds, the browns and the greens, um, but I, I, I don't know, I like that really, um, the, the, the reds and the green with the, the, the white whitish parchment is, is almost like the Welsh flag, so uh, maybe they're onto something there, <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it, once a, a case would come to court, um, the method that they would use to come to a decision is called um, compurgation. Um, and this is a system where if uh, when the person accused or the parties that are there to dispute would give their version of it under oath, um, which is like today, um, and they would then find a number of others who could take an oath um, and be trusted as witnesses as well to help um, give a neutral interpretation. And they would then have um, compurgers required um, to depend on the nature of the case and the judge or sometimes judges would come to a decision. Um, and capital punishment was only used for a small number of crimes as well. I think that's what's so significant about this law is because you'd think that in the medieval period, something as little as maybe stealing a little bit of cheese, you'd be hung. Um, but that seems to be something that was for extreme cases. And on a whole, it was because they felt like that was the right thing to do. Um, you see a lot of compensation being the punishment really. Compensation is something they heavily rely on and is the backbone of um, these laws. Um, there's also ways of making things fair in um, civil disputes as well, um, domestic um, fights, but I think on a whole it's, it's a law um, is a bunch of laws that can give you an insight of the issues and the lives of people in medieval Wales. So um, we'll look into it. Um, also, there was two officers that would help assist the king as well in any of these uh, decisions and inform and give him the down low. Um, but these laws also dealt with homicide, they dealt with theft and um, values of wild and tame because um, land really it did focus on land but it also fo focused on the animals like cattle that were there as well but there was also um a lot of women and a lot of contracts which it, it just seems very um advanced and a lot of women i think it's very refreshing to read from what you read from any other periods and i think it just shows why it's, it's so much more favored um 
And it, here is a, a picture that I just wanted to show you a closer um, closer image of it, um, of a judge. And he, he's got his finger there and he's got, um, finger. he's just sat there judging. Um, so you, you just see all these references throughout the uh, uh, manuscript. And the, the drawings are very distinctive from any other type of manuscript as well. Um, you, you can just see there is and another thing when you look at all the manuscript the way that they've drawn um you can definitely tell this is uh, by one scribe but you can see um possibly another scribe just by um later editions but they're normally just writing rather than um illuminations but I, I like that illumination i think it just put forward uh, uh how they relied and um they relied on um judges and that to bring forward the truth, to bring forward the justice. This was an important factor in ensuring these laws as well were um, followed and um, obeyed and how it was done fairly. Um, so I, I think it's just a, a symbol of uh, Wales and how ahead of their time they were, for, their uh, for the times that these were created. Um, and then what, there's a lot of, um, discussion around the origins of it but the most of the surviving ones like I said uh, a little bit older and there's a lot of ones just describing the laws um but th there's all different types of uh, descriptions of it and that's helped us piece more of a picture as well and even seeing complaints of people so uh, sometimes they'd have um someone where it's gone to court um it would be like a, a piece of paper and um, pretend that's a piece of paper it would be cut down the middle almost and sort of d not cut entirely down the middle so it was almost like tri uh, three pieces of paper that could be taken away um and when you get all those parties together, because they can take away their little agreement on these pieces of paper. When they see each other again, they can sort of put it together. It's almost like a best friend uh, necklace or something could put it together, but it was just a reminder of dispute really. Um, and it's quite interesting when you see things like that because um, a lot of them don't survive because um, but when that person goes, it might not be important to the next person and they get rid of it. But um, you, you do see a lot of them and it's, it's quite interesting sometimes to see where some of these have gone so like I said there's a, a piece of parchment that's been divided into three um one could be in Wales um one could be held by the crown and then there's been some that have been held in America and it just shows how they've moved um because of other people and uh, just donating them in as well um to to be looked after by museums. So I think that's quite cool. Um, but obviously it would probably would have been frustrating for a scholar back in the day to be traveling all these places and um, just to find the other half of it. Um, but that's the, the beauties of uh, the internet now. They've put them all, all over the place and you can sort of uh, crop it out in a way and join them up together. But that's how we get some of the information. Sometimes we have, um, where people have just put axes to agree with an outcome of something. Um, loads of things like that that just shows us how these laws were acted out and how people followed them and what they were thought of, really. Um, so I, I think we, we, we're going to get right, in, right into it, really looking at all these laws and uh, seeing how they all uh, play out. So this is part of Laws of the Court mm -hmm. and this is uh, Landowner's Death, I titled it, but it can mean so many other things. But Landowner's Death seems to be um, one of the big things here because mm. it, land is important and um, especially the animals that was on the land was important as well. And whoever had them, it, 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 was, it was important to, to ensure there was no disputes and so there wasn't more coming to the king. But also this little image here of um of a dog that that was one that was on the book that i showed at the beginning and um, he's there running um so yeah i thought that was what made me click earlier just found in uh, this manuscript uh page but what they viewed was that when a person had died so when um, it was a man um because at the time but women didn't really have property but um when a man had died um there was obviously that issue that um awkward conversation of who's going to own the land um i don't think it probably would have been awkward back then but um it was just who owned the land and um the land was divided equally um 
But what makes this law so significant was how this law had divided the land, because this had clashed with the canon law, um, because they believed that the, per the lands of the person of the deceased, he should have his laws divided between legitimate sons and illegitimate sons. And they saw that was just being fair. Um, and it, it is seen as fair today as well. Um, but canon law didn't believe this. They believed that um, Ill illegitimate children could not inherit and so that this caused a little bit of a clash. But I think it just shows how different Wales was and how different they fought at the time as well. And um, the script is uh, cursive. So this is obviously a different manuscript to the other one that we just looked at because the um, images are a little bit, the uh, illuminations are a little bit different in style and the handwriting's different. And also um, the beginning of the paragraph, um, unlike the other one, um, where some of them began with red, um, this begins with uh, a green color. So um, yeah, they, you, you could pick out so much more, but you could definitely uh, tell that it's a um, masculine um, writing as well, which means it is written between two lines and not four lines, like how we write today. Um, when you learn when you were younger to do handwriting, you'd always have the blue line, red line, red line, blue line, and you've got to write in between um, those lines. But back then it was just writing between just two. And <laughs> this was, hello, yeah? Was it Latin? Um, it, I, I believe so it was. Oh, no, um, some were Latin, there, there's some a were word, in Welsh. There, there's so, a word, um, Libra, there is a word Libra there, which is Latin, but some of the other words do look Welsh. Welsh yeah, it Latin was it was a mixture. Um, yeah. It's yeah. Definitely yeah. as they got later into the period, so that the old the older ones, the ones that no longer survived, they were definitely Welsh. Um, and as time has gone on, they've been mixed with Latin, but the, the English version is definitely just English. Um, medieval English obviously um, and then uh, the Welsh ones just seem to be ones that were very familiar with the people of Wales but they're the ones that have got the illuminations um, and they, they, they just saw the landowner just having his estate in a, a joint custody with all of his sons um, and the it was just fair and I think a lot of us would agree that it's fair today um, but obviously it caused a lot of clash with some other people's beliefs um, it'd be interesting to see you know how much more of an outrage they possibly would have created if they said um, all children even the daughters oh gosh could you imagine um, they'd probably be crying in the streets but um, yeah we're going to move on to uh, the next bunch of laws which I thought was quite interesting um, and the image here just shows I think the very sweet side of it um, and you can see the lines there um, they just the, the big ones, the, the minuscule um, handwriting. Um, but these are known as the laws of the of women, and you see a lot of academic writing on this as well. Um, and it is discussed in some of the books that I've given. Um, and this is just looking at the position of women under Welsh law, which was very significant to their Norman English contemporaries. They seem to have a lot more independence. Um, and they were allowed to establish their marriage in two ways. Um, so they could have it through the Norman way of being given away by uh, the kindred or um, what, what is considered the abnormal way, which is an eloping with a man um, without the consent of a kindred. And I, this image is just shown that there. Um, and I just think that's uh, very lovely um, to just to see that. You can just see them smiling a little bit, the gosswork. Um, yeah, I just thought the fact that they have that in the the manuscript, um, I just makes it add to out to be a, a very nice sort of oh, wholesome little manuscript really to see love poetry in it in that way because you don't really see many manuscripts of people um, kissing each other really so that that's very um, it, it just made me smile to see um, probably just me being um, romantic really. Um, Sometimes I can be soft, sometimes I can just have my moosy days, but today I just feel like, oh. Um, but there was also different types of law as well that they'd uh, discussed, um, which was quite interesting and concerning women, and um, a lot of them discuss um, the uh, domestic um, issues as well. So um, it was said in part of the manuscript of a woman struck 
by her husband, then she was able to sh- struck him back um, because th- that's only fair. Um, but she could claim compensation as well with that and he'd have to pay for that. Um, but then when you look at it the other way around, it seems to be uh, very different um, and it's brought a little bit of a discussion. So um, it's said that um, if a woman uh, is cheated on her husband, um, he's allowed to do two things. He can either sh- struck her or he's allowed to have compensation. Um, and if he struck her, he couldn't have that compensation. Um, and she was allowed to struck him back for struck in her. And, and she was allowed to have compensations. So ultimately, um, she'd be the one that, that was winning no matter. But what they were seeing there was that it was just holding women accountable, but um, giving their husbands a choice of what they could do and what they felt like they could get their justice from. Um, so that's what they were saying here was that women have their own independence, but they also have their own consequences as well um, with the law. So they're not... Um, excluded from it and in some parts of it they were um put forward by laws that were some of the men were allowed to have um they even discussed payments of marriage and um there was a, a fee that was payable to the woman's lord or um for when she's getting ready for marriage um however there was a, a very darker side to it that had come about um where they were discussing um sexual violence and rape for example um what what would happen is that would bring down the woman's worth and so bringing down her reputation so not seeing her so much as an object really and so looking at how she would place herself in society and that was considered as theft so the perpetrator would have to pay for that but as you notice in here it seems to be um issues resolved in a lot of payments or um tit for tat sort of situations there's no death involved yet and i think that's just uh, very significant but they, they did um look further into um uh, the, the the status of um uh, the woman in terms of uh, getting married um she was uh, uh, allowed to um sort of go and sort of find whoever she wants and her family didn't have to dictate to her really and I think that's just giving women freedom um, and I think that's just something if you don't really know much about the medieval period you probably think of everyone in that period as being very barbaric and very uh, close-minded but I think they're very open-minded with things like this um, and it, it just found that women were able to um, have a, a, a a very happy and free life but also they had to be ensured that they were keeping up their bargain of the marriage as well because otherwise they'd face a fine further um if a woman had found her, her husband with another man she was also um entitled to a payment so compensation as well from him of uh, a six score pence um which is half a pound today 50p and um the first time she's allowed to have that um the second time she uh, second time or even the third time if she decides to give him another chance um she's allowed to have a divorce um so that's giving more women freedom um and i, th- I think that's just very important because you don't really see that really and i think it's given women an option of what to do if they didn't feel happy if they felt like they were not being respected by their husbands as well um and women were also told to respect their husbands just like like they're told their husbands are told to respect them as well so they're not allowed to go off and uh, flirt with other men or even just say anything as little as they've said here how nice another man's beard is they can't go off and say things like that um and there's there's a lot of as it gets to a later period, you see a lot of uh, additions to it in terms of uh, maybe um, property in terms of women and sort of how property's divided and how to keep the surviving partner, the woman, alive after her husband has died as well. So as the laws get on, I think they start to get more closer and closer to the interests of the people. And I think it's all about really keeping everyone happy. Um, and I think that's what you will done successfully he wanted to keep everyone happy I think he just wanted um some peace and quiet from people moaning to him all day as well possibly um you know oh he hit me and she, she done this it probably would be tyrants so we probably 
thought, no, it would be more practical to have these laws, to have them dealt um, by people that I trust. Um, and then the really bad ones can come to me. So uh, it, it's given him more time to focus on other things as well. Um, and I think that the, even though they're later manuscripts, I think you've reflected on how happy and it's almost wholesome and light really seeing little images like this um just shows really that the, the social aspects of it of uh, how people felt about it and the, the the culture of wales as well how um they seem to be more of a relaxed society more fair as well and they seem to be taking everyone's perspective in account in terms of making their laws um, and i think that's just very important and these laws are very important because they were codified, they followed a lot of Welsh rulers and princes um, right up until 1535 with uh, King Henry VIII um, bringing Wales under English rule. Um, and we didn't have our laws then until 500 years later when we had a devolved parliament as well. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting to just see the story of Wales as well in terms of their laws, even though they had a big break of it. Um, it you see a lot of references to these laws just because th these, you know, these are amazing, especially for Wales. We should own that. We should be plastering it everywhere, and making everyone known. Um, I've got a heart down states of uh, all the things of Wales, like Welsh identity is like a lot of heart and my mum hangs it on um, she's got a, an amazing wall of all the pictures and she hangs one of them on there and it's got a Welsh lady, it's got the harp, it's got the daffodil, it's got Cardiff Castle, it, all the things that make us Welsh, even a Welsh cake, um, but they should have a uh, Hilda's uh, laws I think on there um, because I really finish it off this is so important to our identity and um, just so amazing to look at um, as well and the, in terms of Welsh handwriting as well they, they have their own sort of insula um, of writing so uh, that's very significant as well um, a, a little bit more of a, a probably a, a, a brutal image he's, he's giving him a good whack on the head really there um he doesn't look very happy either and you, you can see that with uh, the facial features as well that's just how they've got a little smirk on their face and he's there with his trumpet all happy and singing um and he, he, even the dog's got a little bit of a smile to me he mm -hmm. seems a little bit happy so everyone seems to be happy in this but you get to the criminal law and uh, it, it all all of a sudden becomes a little bit more serious um and murder um, they didn't just see it as a murder, as a loss of life. They saw this as an offence against the family. They, I think it just showed the empathy of uh, the, 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 the uh, Huldar and the rulers of Wales. I think it showed the empathy of other people and how this made sense to them. That murder was considered to be the offence because it really affected that family. That family would be affected um, emotionally, but um, economically and loads of other reasons so um th this was a big blow to them really and i think this is the the, the ultimate thing so they'd have this thing called uh, blood money it's described as blood money so again the compensation part of it comes out so um the payment of it was that the payment was from the killer of the family and the sum of it this was different um because some of the laws had fixed punishments of uh, punishment fines but this one this blood money um was based on the person's social status and their position in society as a whole so um again i think it just you can look at that further and say there was a possibly no regard for people of a social status but i think that's just expected uh, for the time period and to them that was logical and um, if they were an important figure with a high social status and position then it would be a big loss to everyone really i think it would just not be the family um and even when very specific in terms of looking at murder by poison for some reason murder by poison was even more even more bad it, it was even more shameful mm. so this was met with a death penalty so this is one of the few things that i had found that had a death penalty to it um and when you look at assault or offenses against a person's honor they were also dealt with a similar fashion so through a fine 
um, unless we've possibly uh, applied to um, upper classes, really. So any serf that had struck a free man was liable to have the offended limb removed, for example. So um, if a serf had uh, affected, uh, it hit a free man, so um, possibly someone who you know was just a higher class and just chilling about and he just struck him he, he'd have his limb removed for that so that's the punishment um which is quite interesting there's a lot of uh, limbs and fingers being removed as punishment rather than death um i think they see it as um you, you see a lot of people wanting the death penalty back and there's always that argument of they want that person to live with it to live with the guilt for the rest of their life and i think that's where this idea is coming from with these uh, with welsh people as well they want people to they, they felt like death was just the easy way out of situations but for some reason poison was a big no-no um and i was just straight up go um and like i said when it came to rape that was seen as theft so that was uh, faced by a payment of a fine um and also when it comes to things like f just thieves in general they would just have their hands cut off so um ultimately again allowing them to be remembered for that um, and it's mostly safe that come under this um law um and there's, there's a lot of sort of uh, penalties are led to theft it, it depended really on the case and what the judge had felt like so um they they were very generous in terms of things like this is what i mean so for example they believed that if a hungry man who had passed three towns without receiving a meal then he could not be punishing for stealing foods because he was in need so they did have that understanding there so they had that belief that if you were going around stealing things and you did have things and you ha have been fed then you had no reason in the first place to steal but if you're going through free towns you're really hungry you've got nothing and you've got nothing to give for compensation either then it only it, it just seems more empathetic to just just let it slide really because um you've just got to take compassion and i think that's why people liked it really was um you weren't being punished um if you had a situation that you couldn't really help they felt like um ultimately if you were hungry um it was a necessity it didn't really matter um so i, I just i like that as well they, it was a, a lot of understanding behind it um anyone who had stolen property they'd have a big fine um and anyone who didn't protect a victim from a, a murder and they had seen it happen they would also have a fine so anyone that wasn't um helping sort of mm. you, you know helping this person out then they're going to face a lot of uh, fines themselves so i think it's in the best interest of everyone to live together in harmony um and also just keep up with these laws because ultimately they seem to be fair especially that one about if you've crossed three towns and you haven't eaten and you steal something well you can, you can get away with it scot-free really because they understood um that the you have to do whatever you need to survive and i don't i don't know i just i like that because they say as well when you read um stephen pink is a psychologist um but he wrote a book called the history of uh, no the better angels of our nature and it's almost like the history of violence and it's very interesting because he bring he's a psychologist so he brings a lot of psychological arguments but in a in a historian's way of writing um it's, it's very interesting and um he talks about the civilizing process happening in the later medieval period this sort of taught people to be empathetic and civilized and this is why um violence has come down um but i disagree you, you have Welsh laws here that are showing that empathy is an important part of these people's identity and their culture and what they wanted to uphold for everyone else really um so I think Wales was onto something really and we were just very laid-back people I think in terms of that we just wanted to be fair um so just having a look at compensation, because I have talked about compensation quite a lot. Um, that is also the English version of the uh, manuscript. Um, all lovely with the weights on it to ensure that the book's up and on that lovely cushion. Um, and when you look at it, it's actually quite a small book. Um, is it, you'd think that it would be a bit bigger, but it's actually quite small. Um, and there's 
it's, it's truly a, a lovely little thing to look at. I think I just like to look at um, the English and the Welsh versions. Just look at the differences as well. Um, but definitely a manuscript that I've been admiring for weeks. Um, like I said, compensation was a way to resolve an issue. Um, I think it was make the victim feel as if they had seen the justice. Um, I think it was also a way of just making sure harmony was in society, making sure everyone was happy living with everyone else um, and reduce the uh, complaints that was being brought to the king as well. Um, like I said, it, it can be a lot of work, I think, having loads of people coming to you day in, day out and m moaning about situations that could easily be sorted if he had written it down really um and i think compensation is very important in these laws because they're they're helping bring you know that sense of justice um they're also um helping punish people for what they've done um and i think they're also acting as a way of, as a deterrent from anyone doing anything because um 50p back then it would have been a bit and I think no one would really want to pay that so they probably thought it'd be better just follow the laws and live happily with people so there'd be no issues at all um and especially with them being so fair as well um you can they understand understandable situations um however um some of them can be a little bit dated in their way of thinking but on a whole I think the ones that we've looked at I think it just highlights to me just how significant it is it is just truly unique and everyone goes on about the Magna Carta and it is important because it inspired um the, the you know the constitution of America and it's helped inspired a lot of other um laws nowadays but I think these ones as well they're significant because it just gives us a glimpse of what the Welsh people um had held close to their heart which was understanding in these situations they understood that if you were hungry um you, you need to steal to eat they understood um the families um but the blow to the family after a murder, um, they understand that women should have their own freedoms. It was just a lot of understanding. I think um, there's also a lot of understanding in terms of um, cheating in marriage and just all those little things like that. And I think it's, that's what makes it truly amazing. And um, it, 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 they even talk about having um, nine, uh, like limbs and there's nine limbs discussed really um, the, 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 the discussed so the the nine limbs and body parts really that are discussed the most is hands the eyes the lips the feet and the nose and another thing is they discuss in here if a lawyer has been found um being corrupt sort of getting in the way of justice um it, it said that he would have his tongue removed as well because like i said tongue of a lawyer is an important symbol in this because is the instrument of truth and that's what the judge re re relies on really um, to get the truth out of uh, the situation and get a fair analysis of everything that's going on um, and that the, the lawyer the person representing would be uh, punished um, for, for not upholding these values um, so again stressing on how important Wales thinks uh, these laws are um, and the these values given to these body parts, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the lips and the hands, because they were important for working, they were important for everyday life. Um, they were just important with communicating to people. Um, it, overall, it affects your quality of life, um, they felt like, and so that's what they've done. Um, so when you get to the older manuscripts, like I've said, they're, they're mostly in Welsh, but then you get to some of the older ones. Um, they're in Latin as well, um, and it just shows the um, the change of language as well um, in Wales. Sometimes what they felt like was um, important in terms of um, official works. Um, it's not in the vernacular, and I think that just shows of uh, the, the the language of judges, etc. And I think when you look at the illuminations, even though they're not fancy gold illuminations, the expensive colours as well, um, they, they're showing the importance of uh, showing these things acted out so people know the situations if they can read it as well. But um, 
they show who commissioned it as well um had a lot of money and the fact that the welsh ones have illuminations as well um in my eyes shows more money was put into it because it was more important to the welsh people and welsh identity um and compensation is at the heart of this as well um death fines uh, removal of parts of the bodies their deterrent the acts of justice and overall i think that it's just a way of dealing with the situation and just ensuring everyone follows the uh, rules which is why we get to this thing of responsibility i think this is the overall concluding thing that they have for everyone in wales is that sense of responsibility and responsibility is important in terms of women as well it seems like they're responsible for themselves not anyone else is responsible for them and um if a woman was to break laws as well she was also able to um be held responsible for her actions and see the consequences um and criminals are held accountable because they they either pay their life or um they, they pay fines fees uh held accountable for the removal of uh, body parts, etc. So even uh, lawyers with the removal of uh, their tongue as well. But um, there's officers as well that assist the king, that they're given the down low on everything because um, he possibly just want a little recap of everything, see if everything's going well. Um, and just seeing if justice is being served, he's, he's holding everyone accountable, really. It's the first time I think you see an early form of checks and balances. People argue... Um, in politics, especially this book here called uh, Global Politics by Andrew Hayward. It's a very good book um, and it's about uh, modern democracy. Um, democracy is considered to be a very new thing. We're in the early stages of democracy, so we're still figuring it out, really, because we've had a, a, a um, loads of years and history of autocracy um, in their, their eyes. But I think you start to see, they start to argue that when democracy comes about, that's when we get checks and balances. But I think this is almost, almost like checks and balances on the judges, on the lawyers, on the kings. Uh, on the king, on the people, um, on everyone in society, really. Um, and it even says things like here. So this is an example. Um, if you were chopping down a tree and um, you had to tell people, you had to tell people that you were doing it, give everyone a warning. Um, because if that tree had fallen on someone um, and that they had been warned about it, then it was their fault, really. Um, I think that that's something that you see about today. If you tell someone, I'll oh, be careful of this, you might get hurt. And then the next thing you'll know that they've gone and done and they've got hurt. You'd say, well, it's your fault, it's self-inflicted. And that was what the argument of this was. Um, and you weren't given any compensation. But if you weren't warned about that and you got hit by that tree, then you would get that compensation. So again, it's seeing how fair things are. I think they would have understood that there would have been a case where they said that if you were hit by a tree, um, you'd have compensation. And then they'd have this dispute where someone said, well, I did warn her. Um, she walked underneath that tree and she just got hit on the head. So it's not my fault. And that's where they're, in, where they're getting their laws from. That it's based on the complaints of the people and what really bothered the people the most really so um I, I i like that um everyone's a responsible no matter how little or big the issue is um i just want to show you a few um manuscript images um from all different types of uh, manuscripts really um you see the importance of animals here the horse and the person just sort of going about their daily life you've got the lovers kissing you've got the judge you've got the person more sort of plucking the the feathers out of birds um you've got someone there sort of uh with a bird and an instrument in their hand and then like i said that one there with the fight um and it seems like the fight is the one where they look the most annoyed out of everyone else really Everyone's got like a little slight smirk to them or just a, um, a neutral face. So uh, I think it just highlights the importance here. So you've got the importance of animals, you've got the importance of trade, you've got the importance of the judges, you've got the importance of dealing with disputes and you've got the importance of allowing women um, to have independence and even marry who they wanted to marry. And um, I think they're very nice drawings as well. You can just, they're very distinctive, the drawings of the people as well. Um, I just really like them. Um, and we're just going to go go on to the uh, next part of it, which is uh, coming towards the end, but this is the uh, 
impacts of the uh, Norman and Edwardian conquests, really, and um, how they impacted this. So, um, I just will quickly go through this. So, the Welsh laws um, were usually applied in um, the Welsh marches. So, as well as areas that were ruled by princes, so this was still being held in the uh, Norman conquests, and they even had um, if there was a dispute and um, but the, the regions um, were also then being looked into to see what law had applied. Um, but if it was done in um, Wales, the issue was done in Wales and not England, for example, if one part was in England, <coughs> one was in Wales, um, if the act of, uh, uh, the, the, the criminal act had been um, done in Wales, for example, then um, it would be dealt with Welsh law. So that's how it kind of, uh, crossed over with the Norman world but in 1281 um, lands concerned lay in Wales and um, the, the, the laws the, the, so the lands in Wales that were concerned um, in all of this they, they would still have the laws being used and um, it seemed like Wales was holding on to this codified law for throughout a, a long time and even a lot of conquests when you get to the Edwardian conquest um, you see this Welsh law being held as an important badge of nationhood how this was um, part of their pride as well and I think it should still be part of our pride now um, and it, this is just um like their mascot, this thing that they were proud to show off. Um, and then after the Edwardian conquest, Welsh law was only being used for um, civil cases at that point, really. Um, but when it came to Henry VIII and his Laws and Wales Acts of 1535 to 1542, um, he's bringing this with Wales underneath English rule and the customs, customs of Wales, so the Welsh law that we discussed about was the main target for the attack as well, um, for Welsh identity. And a lot of people um, have discussed that in terms of, uh, and in terms of now with the Welsh independence sort of movement, they say that we should take it back because we've uh, been stolen of our culture and identity for years. Um, and I just want to quickly look at the significance as well. These uh, these have held such a significant in the medieval period. You see it being remade in later medieval times, um, and the Welsh version and the Welsh Latin version are um, illuminated a lot, which shows what was mostly used in Wales and how that was important. I think the English one was for the understanding of anyone that didn't speak the languages of this. Um, like I said, Hildar was seen as the king of the people, and I think these laws helped that um, because they were fair. They were able to bring harmony into society, and people understood that, he, you know, he, he understands what we're coming, about, we're coming from because he's probably heard so many complaints, um, and they seemed fair. Again, if you got hit by a tree and someone warned you, well, it's your fault. Um, it just seemed like very logical, understand, understandable sort of situations. And these laws were held in Welsh culture for years, and they've seen many conflicts and many conquests throughout the time, and um, eventually seen an end in 1535. Um, but they, I think they held strong to go for as long as they did. And I think it highlights that codified laws, um, they're very modern really because it's argued that code of Floyd's laws um didn't really exist until democracy again um but you can just argue against that further um but it's just seen as progressive i think everyone can understand that it's progressive um and it's even referenced um in popular culture as well um so the you've got the cad file um Chronicles by um, Ellis Peters, um, who uses the ancient Welsh laws. You even have the Monk's Hood, which mentions these laws as well. Um, and you just see it being um, used a lot more, especially today, you see it a lot more, um, in, like I said, the, the independence movement, this is something that they want to reclaim as something, it's pride really of our history. Um, and I think it is, it's the, the heart of our Welsh identity um, and our culture. And on a conclusion, I think he's ahead of his time. And I think it just highlights why Huldar was called the way he was and why he was so popular. It was so popular because it carried on for many years. It had stayed very resilient and it even inspired some rulers to even put some more of their um, 
uh, ideas into it as well. Um, and Welsh versions of it, of the illumination, it shows the importance of the manuscript to the Welsh people and highlights further why is at the heart of our Welsh identity, because this is something that everyone could get behind. It showed you the little disputes of every day. Um, and the illuminations um, is rare because you don't really see legal manuscripts or anything like that. To have illuminations, they seem to be um, very quickly made, um, tend not to be in a book either. They're normally um, on a scroll sometimes with uh, membranes on it, um, at the, well, they call membranes each section um, instead of pages. Um, yeah, so I think that's just very rare. Again, adding to the how unique this manuscript and why we need to look at it further. And then it just sort of highlights, I think, um, you know, at the end of it, we had 500 years of no law and then Wales have got their own um, contemporary uh, laws then, which uh, people had said that, you know, some of it, it sort of uh, was, it looked at this sort of justice system and it, in a way, a lot of laws were derived from a justice system just like that. Um, so they said that they even brought inspiration for contemporary laws today, um, but not entirely. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I wanted to share with you all today and I hope you've enjoyed it. So I'll um, stop share and I'll ask everyone questions. So um, Anne, anything that you'd like to uh, say? I was just wondering who would have written them, you know, whereas uh, most of the scripts are, are written by you know, monks um, in monasteries, would this be clerks? Would they start having clerks now or clerics? Yeah, um, from what I read, um, the, these, some of the manuscripts, they, they don't know who the scribe is. And so yeah. that's left, left to a discussion, which is quite interesting because you go down to who would be the best person. Um, but there's some manuscripts where they know the scribe has been um, an advisor of the king um, or very someone very close to him as well, that he kept yeah. close for those purposes as well, um, which has led people to say that maybe the unknown scribes were um, someone that worked for a ruler that we just don't know anymore. Um, but even then, we don't even have their name. Um, it, they sort of tend to be written, especially with uh, some monks as well, for example. They normally write themselves down as like scribe one, and scribe two, mm. and things like that. So you only really get to know them by a number. Um, so it, it's a shame, really. Um, mm. it, you can't really find more about them. But uh, yeah, very interesting. So thank you, Anne. Um, Peter? Oh, nothing for me. No, very good. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Peter. Sorry. Go on, Anne. Go on. Well, I just wondered if, yeah, it's probably, you know, like they would want the, to think that the king did it, you know, like, mm. you know, they, they would um, probably, <clears throat> it wouldn't matter who did it really, it's from the king. But I just wondered how the church maybe. The church was letting go, but I don't think they were because he was, he was, he was, his throne was in, um, in Wales, wasn't it? That, mm. that monastery. Yeah, and I, I, I think, um, I think here, what's interesting, because yeah, yeah. how it conflicts with canon law as well, it seems like religion was just left out of it. And I think that mm. also highlights how progressive it is, <coughs> how they felt like church had no place in this at all. And even yeah. when you look at overviews of it, it, it's never focused on the church, which yeah. is very interesting, actually, as well, especially for the time period. No, thank you, Anne. Um, Bill, anything that you'd like to uh, ask? I think your notes say it all, actually, Jess. Um, I think it's remarkable that we have this system of codified laws in Wales long before Saxon law and the later Norman law, etc., English law, obviously copied a lot uh, from it, you know. And mm. um, what, what Anne said about um, who, who wrote the laws, etc., obviously they were educated people because they were written in a mixture of Latin and uh, on Welsh, which would indicate, yes, it came from the church, but there would have to be a system of administration to actually mm -hmm. enact all the laws, etc., um, a system of magistrates, and if there was such a thing as defence lawyers or, uh, or things like that, um, the system of uh, witnesses and statements, and then the, a judge, wherever that judge was deciding, it would have to be um, well controlled and uh, throughout Wales, really. Mm -hmm. comes to another point, 
And I assume that, I might be wrong about this, that Wales was never a kingdom. So, but on paper, however, there must have been something similar to that. Yeah. Not to actually en enact all these laws throughout Wales. And, and the principle of getting through to people that they were responsible for their own actions under the law. And if they transgressed, they would actually, actually have to be um, uh, punished according to the law, you know. Mm. Uh, but there are some peculiarities, like the fact that you could stab somebody to death and not be executed. If you poison them, you could be yeah. and things like that. But of course, we're looking at it from our 20th century perspective only. We yeah. don't know what the mindset was then to enact these laws, but it was seen to be very, very fair. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's, a, it, it's just remarkable, really. And uh, the laws of Howell Dars certainly haven't had the attention and the praise from the legal system in you know, modern days that they deserve, really, you know. Mm. We've always got to keep fighting our corner and then yeah. ourselves, you know, and actually um, champion the cause of Welsh heritage and what it's done for the rest of uh, the UK, you know. Yeah. yeah. So let's keep uh, flying the flag and fighting our corner. Thanks, yeah. Jess. Definitely, Bill. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it is definitely interesting. Um, David uh, Stevenson that I referenced, he does look into um, Welsh political history in that period as well, um, and a little bit later. So he gives us a, a lowdown of that. I haven't uh, read it completely yet, but I think it would be interesting to see how um, that all plays out and how he sees Wales either being a kingdom or whatever he sees it to be like so um yeah I think that would be something that we need to be uh, discussing further in the future once I've given it a lowdown um I've yeah. been scribbling <laughs> notes already in the introduction um but thank you uh Bill um Richard anything that you'd like to ask oh no really interesting yeah. no thank you yeah, I think said it all. yeah thank you um uh Pat, uh, anything that you'd like to ask? Um, yeah, I wanted to mention a few things. Uh, first yeah. of all, I'm, you know, I, I hadn't heard anything about hands being removed except, you know, the Arabs or something. So I was, you know, oh. and then when you talked about fingers and eyes and, oh dear, it, uh, <laughs> you know, did they bleed to death and then die, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. They don't, <laughs> they do, they see, from what I read about as well, sometimes with it, it, things being acted out um, in a later period, they don't tend to see that uh, talk about what happened afterwards. It just seems to talk about the outcome of what is discussed, and that's yeah. the end of that. So it's almost like the uh, history of that person, of what happened to him, is forgotten to time, um, and we can only be left there to imagine. Um, I, I, the eye thing, I think, really got to me as well. Um, Oh yeah, oh, I think oh, that's oh, probably the, the oh. whole pro the, uh, part of it as well is that, that these horrible uh, punishments that would have got it's other people all, thinking, um, oh no. An eye for an eye, it's all Old Testament. Yeah. yeah. Like, if an eye offend, they pluck it out, you know. Oh. Yeah. But then that that's not what Jesus said, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Old Testament <laughs> tends to uh, conflict you know, with the uh, new one. People like chopping things off in those days, didn't they? Yeah, they <laughs> did. With one finger, did you see that illustration? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. um, I think I heard um, something along the lines of uh, um, the, the whole thing about Welsh people and sheep. Um, I'll put it that way because it's oh, going on yeah, YouTube. Yeah. Um, I read that, um, I, I don't know whether it's entirely true, but this is where my friend when we were on a history trip and it came up in my, uh, my uh, Snapchat memories from four years ago and we were talking about where did that come from and she said oh I know I know I know she said um back then she said it, 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 if you were caught stealing a sheep um you would be sentenced to death but if you were caught um doing uh, naughty things with a yeah. sheep um you just have your finger cut off so it oh. just seemed to be more better for because a lot of pe Welsh people were stealing um English sheep and that was the way that they were getting away with it was saying oh, oh I was doing naughty things with the sheep go on cut my finger off and uh, this would seem to be a better way of getting away with it really. Well, could, could I add something very rude about this and I, I apologize for this um, <laughs> but Jesus College in um, Oxford is called the Welsh College. Mm. It was founded by Welsh and the newsletter there is, I'm sorry to say this, but it's the Sheep Shagger. That's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. The, the newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. No, um, oh. the, the amount of times that's been brought up as well in uni when yeah. you meet people who are from Wales, if it's been said. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming today. 
I got Thank you, Jess. That is, that is very interesting. Thank you very much. When did they start? When did they start using this law? Pardon? When did they start using these laws? What year was it? I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, I, I would like to look into it actually further. Um, and I think I'm going to make that my homework, actually. Let me quickly <laughs> okay. write that down. Um, I know it's a medieval period, but I don't know where it starts. <laughs> Because we were talking about it on the bus, we're, we're all drunk on the bus, so uh, th th there wasn't much sense to be amazed. I just sort of looked back at the video the other day and thought, oh, I remember it bringing up that fact. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll have a little look into that. Um, so well, thank you, everyone. I, I do like okay, that. Thank you, then. Thank you, Jess. Take care. I'll speak to you at the end if you want. Um, okay, okay. Take, take care, bye. everyone. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Bye. Yeah. I just wanted to say, like you, 